I get to, in my dad's, we'll call it fourth quarter, uh, spend this time with him. Uh, and I feel lucky and guilty that I have two brothers that don't get that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm basically getting downloaded all of the burn and learn of a very wise, successful, loving um, human being that's given an opportunity to 15,000 agents plus leaders and, and the people that whose lives that they impact. Like, you see us getting emotional like this I is awesome. And hear me lovingly, we irritate the hell out of each other. But that's so small in the grand scheme of like the legacy that that is actually being passed. Welcome back to the show. I am your host, Remington Ramsey. And today we have two powerhouse people from the Atlanta market. And uh, Kalinsky is their name and transition of power is the game. We have Bob Kalinsky, who has been the regional operating partner of the Southeast region of Keller Williams, uh, which is a three state region. And the transition of power happens to be his daughter, Anna Kalinsky. Guys, thanks for joining the show. So happy to be here. Really, very, very, very nice of you to have us on. Well, we're excited to talk about what this looks like. Bob, your story is fascinating. We'll start with you uh, getting into real estate. The Keller Williams model, uh, you've you've seen it kind of take off uh, early on, uh, partnering and, and fl flying out to meet Gary, hitting it off, and then having a, having a constant dialogue with him through the process. What was it like in the early days? Scary, but also <laughs> exciting. What so, was scary about it? Uh, well, it was unknown. Keller who uh, I had to move cities. I had to change companies. I had to part myself from all my networks, friends and background where I was known and had credibility and, and, a, and a reputation. And I had to move to an area that I knew no one and try and pioneer a concept that was not in that area whatsoever. Sure. What year was that? That was 1999. So getting into, and for those of us who are listening to the model, like you've never sold a home and so, and there's part, uh, there's, there's structure within Keller Williams that really calls for sound business minds, uh, to train. And so, uh, you fl transition to Anna, who's sold a lot of homes and we, we, often judge, okay, just because someone's good at selling a home doesn't make them talented at communicating how to sell or lead. And just because someone's good at leading doesn't mean they can personally sell the home. But you guys have tapped into something that's pretty impressive, which is building it and then leading it. And what do you think? So um, Anna, from your perspective, uh, I think you said in the pre-show you had never intended on selling a home in the first place. What is that all about? Well, you know, I grew Bob and I grew up in Metairie, Louisiana, which is right outside of New Orleans. And he was the office manager or broker of a small real estate company in New Orleans. And so after school, I'd go over and help do little things like organize papers, wipe down real estate signs that would have like mud splashes on them. And I just remember being in that office thinking like, I am never going to be a real estate agent. It was just a <laughs> lot of hairspray, a lot of jewelry, um, all the things that you would envision when you you would see like a, a, a magazine of realtors back in the the seventies and the eighties. And yeah, um, it, it wasn't shots. until I was in my mid twenties that I actually had a corporate job and a, a a salary that allowed me to get into home ownership. Um, not even thinking that I could, I had two brothers who were mortgage brokers at the time. And they're like, you can totally buy a house on $45,000 a year. And I was like, that's crazy. And I ended up buying a, a duplex in an up and coming neighborhood. I didn't know that I was buying a great investment property. I just, that was the one thing I want to give credit to with, with Bob and, and my dad is he never pushed the idea on me. He was never like, you're going to grow up and be in real estate. In fact, we never really spoke about that. It really was more by osmosis. And so when I bought my first property in 2005 in Atlanta, I was like really intrigued with the process that the builder took to renovate and all the things that I was less interested in the process of buying the house itself. It more so like the actual construction of the home. And so I kind of latched onto this, this builder in the area. I actually ended up sitting down with my dad. We did a business plan on the back of a napkin and like a little meet and three place on the West side. 
and decided to quit my corporate job and go work for this guy to renovate homes. I was going to be his project manager. And you can imagine that at 25, 26 years old, um, there's not, at least when I was that age, there was not a lot of people my age that were also realtors. It was not something you went to school for. You were typically um, 40, 50, 60 years old, typically when it was at least my perspective of, you know, sure. kind of the age range of the typical real estate agent. Um, and so when some of my friends started getting married and having babies at the end of their 20s after college, I was the only one in their peer group that had the knowledge of how to buy and sell real estate. And that was kind of a cutting edge concept at the time. And so I naturally just kind of fell into that. And I, I I did resist it for a little while until I realized that real estate was less about houses and more about process and people and bringing a solution to the table. And that was something that really energized me was being a, a solution provider throughout all of my peer group and um, various people. And I don't want to say the rest is history because I built a huge business off of that concept, but that's how I got into it. Um, sure. kind of couldn't avoid it at that point. It's funny that you mentioned like the perspective you had as a kid, because how old would you have been when you were doing the um, uh, like the admin stuff in the office? 15, 16. Yeah. So I was even younger than that. I When I remember my first real estate agent encounter and it, it was like, I thought they had to have a big balloon pin, right? The Remax. Yep. I thought that every real estate agent worked for Remax, which I guess is good on them for that marketing, at least for a, a 10 year old kid. I thought you had to be a grandma and have the hairspray. And it just seemed like such a boring industry. And what's funny about that, and that's a very limited perspective uh, for a 10 to 15 year old. But I wonder like how how much that plays into the delaying of, oh, wait, actually, this is really cool. If you look at uh, all the billionaires in the world, they all have something to do with real estate. So there's something business wise here that I should pay attention to. What was it about the transition from 15-year-old pushing uh, papers to uh, massive success? What was the trans- What happened to where you're like, oh, I can, this I is actually it. something I should look into? Yeah, well, I actually went to school. I went to the business school at Alabama. And specifically, I went for inf- management of information systems. And that sounds really nerdy. I did learn how to program, but that was not what I was going to do for the rest of my life. What they taught me was how to use technology in the process of thought to kind of get through a solution. So rapid problem solving, logical problem solving, and just the linear approach to how you create a process and then you create an experience for somebody. And then before I actually quit my corporate job, I was in the world of this this company called um, Matter, and they were a brand strategy company and their focus was on the consumer experience. So my background in consumer experience, my background in information systems, which is really logical problem solving and project management, if I package all of those three together and then I put people in the mix, that is what has allowed me to create a really big business. I think it was so much less about real estate, but the fact that everybody needs a place to live, right? Even if you're renting um, or if you're purchasing a property or selling a property, real estate came into the fold at these major turning points in these people's lives. And it wasn't really about the house. It was about what the house gave their life in terms of experience, what it felt like to come home, what it felt like to have refuge from a stressful day, what it felt like to have a sense of ownership, to put paint on your walls and put pictures up and not be subject to a landlord. So that was more of an experience for people than it was, let me just help you buy a house. So I connected all those dots and that became way more intriguing for me because it was going to be an endless, um, endless game of experiences. Every person had a different experience going through that process. And that's what kept it new and fresh and interesting for me. And I kind of got to come in with like a little superhero cape and be a solution provider and be somebody that won for them in that process. And then the relationship was built. Let me I just, like it. Can I piggyback on that for a second? Yeah, go ahead. At Keller Williams, one of our sayings is we don't really say so many units sold this year. How many families served by us this year? Yeah. And that's a concept twist. And that's exactly what Anna's explaining. Yes, the house is the object, but that's not the experience or the purpose. It's well, just it's a means to an end. 
So let's talk if about this. If you given me a different widget, I would have done the same thing. But houses, I, you know, growing up in New Orleans, I loved interesting architecture. I loved, and that was kind of part of the joke. I live inside the city of Atlanta and I haven't really tested it. Could I still be a really successful real estate agent if I moved to outside of the perimeter, which is where maybe more pre-planned developments are, where houses look a little bit more like the same? The architecture is what kept me interested, but then it became about the people and then yep. it became about the solution for the people. And that's what kept me going. I don't, I haven't sold a house in three years and Bob has never sold a house. So there's got to be some, some sort of hook in the industry that makes you feel valuable and yeah. a place where you're able to provide value. Well, and Bob, that's what I want to talk about. But quick question, completely off topic. Did you guys have a banana tree when you lived in New Orleans? No, but I knew where one was. Well, see, this is why you were talking about limited perspective of kids. When I was a kid, I visited New Orleans and my one friend that I had that lived there had a banana tree. So I assumed that everyone like that was so weird to me coming growing up in Indiana that someone had a banana tree in their backyard. So I just assumed that everyone did. So again, limited perspective right there. Bob, you've never sold a home and you're breaking the stigma that you need to to build this massive success in real estate. What what do you have to say towards that concept where you 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 built, you know, this in this three state three state region um something that is take it had taken you a while to the point uh, where you needed to find a successor. I mean, we're going to get to that part, but how did you do that having never sold a home? Well, I don't think building a real estate business like an office where agents work is about selling houses. It's more about providing services, platforms, and values for the agents so they can sell houses. So although it was, it was nice for me to know what happened during the process, it was more important that I knew how business worked mm. and take the principles and whether you're going to open a retail coffee shop, whether you're going to open a real estate company or whether you're going to real, uh, you know, a, some sort of trucking company, the principles of business are pretty much the same across most industries, people, products, service, delivery, experience, satisfaction, and then how the money flows. So what I did, I got out of IBM at the age of 30 tech world back then. And I basically, I was out of work because I started a small company that failed. I started looking around and I had an MBA from Tulane. I was an electrical engineer by trade, by training. Didn't want to be an engineer, but I said business is the way to go. And I had to make a decision. What industry do I get into? Where do I build a career? And my two parameters were I'd have flexibility and I could use what I learned for my own wealth building. And that boiled it down to two areas, a mm -hmm. stockbroker or in the real estate business of some kind. So I got partnered up with a guy who really knew real estate, but I knew business. So what I did was I came in the back door of the real estate company as a business. My agents taught me how to about real estate sales. And I taught them about business platforms. And I even taught the broker who was a real estate guru in New Orleans about how to expand his business. And in eight years, we started from scratch, built four offices, had 400 agents, probably selling, you know, mainly investment property that time and some residential property and cornered about 10% about of the market share. So that got me to call a banker just before the crash in 1980. Then I went to work for this other company Anna was talking about, which ended up being 22 offices in two states. And I was the general manager. So, but I got fired. My wife died and Anna went to college, my last child. So I'm an empty nester, I'm a widower, and I'm unemployed at age 55. Hmm. And I met somebody from Keller Williams who just rang my phone. And sometimes this is a lesson I've learned. Always answer the phone, always have a discussion. You never know what's on the other side of that, what options are open to you. Don't shut it down because... It may not be the right thing, but it might lead you to the right thing, which it did. And I got to meet Gary Keller. And Gary explained the type of company that I wish I'd been in for 25 years before I met it. The platform of Keller Williams was just intriguing to me. And you mentioned Remax. I'll give Remax credit. I thought Remax was one of the most innovative companies coming to New Orleans at the time they did with the platform, the program, and how they treated their agents. 
because it was a business-minded model. In my mind, Keller Williams just plussed it. So I got into the business of opening offices, getting them to be business is for people to make money. And their, their trade, if you will, was selling houses. Well, and so as you're training these realtors, not all realtors are created equal, as we all know. And not all realtors get into it thinking about the business. I think they all they all may want to have a good business in quotation marks. But when it comes to like being a business owner, sometimes they might divorce themselves from that thought, thought and only see themselves as a realtor selling homes. And I think what's interesting is it sounds like you provided leadership to really break that in the mind of a realtor that came into your fold and really teaching them the skills to how to run not only a sustainable business, but I'm guessing one that you can walk away from and, and appoint a successor. Was that a focus? Well, but I, I always look at this way. The analogy I would use is how many NFL team owners ever played football? <laughs> Probably not very many. few. Not many. In fact, there, are of, there are a lot of great coaches that never played football. Right. Basketball. But they ended up being a very good coach or a good, very good business person yeah. working with the people who actually did the trade or the transaction. Yeah. Go ahead, Anna. Oh. I'll, I'll speak to that on the ground level because I'm the recipient of the business training. And even though I went to the business school, which I think was a byproduct of what my brothers did, I don't think I made a conscious choice to like go into business. I have a very clear memory of sitting at the kitchen table with Bob and whipping out the checkbook when you used to actually have to balance your checks to make sure they cleared the bank and what it was like to reconcile your checkbook. And I think, I don't think that he was knowingly grooming his replacement, but when I, when I got into the industry and, and this is really true for any industry, some, you know, there's a lot of really great doctors, a lot of really great sports professionals that are really good at their craft that are terrible business people. Mm -hmm. And I, I do wish, and, and I think maybe this is part of a slice of part of my passion and a part of my purpose here at the region is I do want to give back to people that are really, really good at what they do, but that can't take it to the next level because they don't know how. And it's not their fault, right? Like most, most people in the real estate industry didn't go to the business school. They didn't have a dad who balanced checkbooks. They didn't have that kind of background. And they're really, they have a great personality. They're good at sales. They might even make a lot of money. But a lot of them don't know how to keep all the money. A lot of them don't know the protocol of understanding how to save the money that they keep or what a business plan looks like or how to, you know, minimize your tax liability. And so these are things that you just don't think about when you get into the real estate industry. You just think, I need to sell more people, more houses so I can have a bigger business. And then, like he's never sold a house but he's running the region, I would say that my team and my real estate practice actually groomed me into leadership. I did not get into the real estate business to lead other people. I just didn't think about that. I was never going to be like, oh, I want to have a team of 15 people I'm responsible for. Never right. crossed my mind. But they say, if you want to go fast, excuse me, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think it's a big part of building a really great business, whether it's within a region, or whether it's in a real estate team, is that you will eventually need to learn how to lead other people. And that comes in the form of pouring into their life and helping them have big businesses. So if I cannot lead by example, if I cannot show them how I saved my own money or how I set up my organization or how I converted that lead or how I handled a difficult situation, I'm not then in the people development business, which has allowed me to go further. Bob had to find great leaders to take his concept to go franchise. He developed the people development skill. And I think that's the big difference between a real estate agent and a business builder is deciding that you adopt systems models and you know how to develop people. Mm -hmm. It's interesting your route though, because had you, I mean, it's possible you could have been taking over this role, having never again, like Bob, never been in real estate, but your route was real estate. You do, you took over a team and because I'm guessing because of the success of your leadership within the team is what gave you the nod to to take over, not necessarily how many homes you sold. Am I right in saying that? I don't think that I would have been a candidate for this role if I didn't demonstrate that I could use the systems and models in the ecosystem that already existed. Yeah. Like Bob wouldn't have found someone to, you know, I could be wrong, dad, 
call me out here. I don't know that you would have found someone outside of Keller Williams at this point in the in the region's trajectory to take over this role. I no. think it had to be somebody who could demonstrate mastery in the industry, have influence in the marketplace, but also amongst other leaders like, you know, that I'm not a no name, but also be able to demonstrate that they've been able to grow something successfully. There's a track record of success. So his business partner, um, Kay Evans, who's amazing, uh, 84 and still just so involved, gives back so much, especially on a luxury level for our region. She will say that every, every opportunity you have is a platform and it's a platform to shine. And I think that they, they take the mantra that you need to be so good that you can no longer be ignored. Like opportunity doesn't just show up because I want it. I think Mm. it's the combination between luck and preparedness. And I would say that while I would never suggest that I'm prepared everything that I need to know for the role that I'm in. Cause I definitely have a lot to learn. I have a lot of new ways of doing things. It's a completely different business. I am prepared in certain ways. And it was a combination of being in the right place at the right time to be able to take on that opportunity that, that I was able to say, yes, that makes yeah. sense. But here's what I'm going to say. Bro. What Anna brings, and this has nothing to do with my the fact she's my daughter. She brings the street knowledge that I didn't have with the leadership skills and the business skills that I did have. So if you add that third dimension, now we take, and what I'm looking for, my partners are looking for, how do we take what we built and plus it? And I think Anna's profile is the plus it. So it's not just a Kalinske to Kalinske transition. You know, it's not like, you know, what's that Yellowstone? It's not not that type of uh, situation. It yeah. actually is who is the most qualified. And in the early days, she's very involved in it now, six, seven months into the game. But in the early days, two, three, four years ago, when we started making this plan to transist the three major partners out of operations, it was quite a dilemma. Who, yeah. do, you, who do you replace a founder with? Because founders have certain things like their firstborn. Whereas new people, they didn't birth those people. Now they inherit those people. So especially in family owned or closely owned companies, it's really a problem. I mean, they have whole schools at various kinds of schools around the company, colleges on family owned business technology, because it's a thing. It's a very weird thing. At the same time, it's a very emotional thing. Yeah. And so I really resisted. As I told you earlier, I said, I say, I don't want her to have it. I didn't know as a dad whether she wanted it, actually whether it was good for her. She yeah. knew so well she was where she was. And then coming in behind three people who dynamically built something and having to plus it, that's a heavy burden. That's not light. What's interesting about the takeover, and I do want to get so um briefly describe the the trans because this is not like a hey i'm retiring this year you take over see ya um i'll give you a couple of days to show you how to log into all the different portals this is a process because this is a this is a massive you know company and so what does the process look like from the time that you say you are the person you're the successor how long does that take? You mentioned in the pre-show you're in your sophomore year. So this is this is not a even an, a, a year long thing. This is multiple years. What does that look like? Well, I'll say one thing really quickly, and this is more on a selfish note. Um, Yes, big shoes to fill. Yes, a lot of pressure. Yes, I was having a great ride with the real estate team. It afforded us a great life. I could have kept going. I had someone challenge me when they asked me what I was building. And I said, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, you've built this really big real estate team. You've you could do this. You could buy more real estate. You know, we've got 18, 19 units in real, you know, um, rentable real estate. I could just not do this and life would be fine. And he, he sort of challenged me to say like, Hey, I hear you, but aren't you playing a little small by just being stingy with your gifts? Like, why wouldn't you go make a bigger impact instead of making an impact on 15 people? Why don't you go do it on 15,000 people? And that sort of like shook me into it. Like, I don't feel like we're put here for a life of leisure. I think we're put here for a life of exertion. And that's a more of a soul conversation we can get into at a later date. 
But the gift that this particular transition offers me in addition to becoming a better leader, a better influence, um, an agit a healthy agitator in businesses and people's lives is I get to, in my dad's, we'll call it fourth quarter, uh, spend this time with him. Uh, and I feel lucky and guilty that I have two brothers that don't get that. Mm. Um, I'm basically getting downloaded all of the burn and learn of a very wise, successful, loving um, human being that's given an opportunity to 15,000 agents plus leaders and and the people that whose lives that they impact. Like you see us getting emotional like this. I is awesome. like, Yeah. And hear me lovingly, we irritate the hell out of each other. But that's so small in the grand scheme of like the legacy that that is actually being passed. Yeah. So, like it's a huge gift and it's a big responsibility. And I don't take that lightly. And so the transition, like if Bob dropped dead one day, well, shit, I'm in trouble because there's a lot of information in there that I need. And there's like little things that I'm teaching him how to do. But he's moved these massive Legos around. Yeah. And I have to understand how they're all glued together. Uh, and that you don't just unpack that in one day, you unpack that in a in, in years, for lack of a better way of saying it. So my counterpart, our regional director, who is not new to the role, but she's new to the region, we've got two new people taking on this opportunity, for lack of a better way of saying it, with three seasoned people that are retiring, getting out of the business working to enjoy their lives. So Bob has done a really great job to be very um, emphatic around what I would describe as the big rocks of the region, like for any business, right? Like I'm yeah. passing the baton to two leaders on my team. They need to know what the important things are. What are the metrics that we track? What are the, the dials that you need to have an, an eye on to know whether things are rising or falling? So you're not just yeah. losing so slowly you think you're winning. Um, and so he's done a really great job to outline the big rocks of the region. Like the phone is going to ring. Do not let that suck you in and be the whirlwind of your day. Here are the pillars of our region. And this comes first and everything else is noise. Yeah. Uh, being very protective of that because we're in business with Keller Williams International and they have their own requirements of us. And yeah. so if we don't gatekeep the day to day. Um, big rocks, then we just get sucked into the vortex and then I lose track of what we're focused on. So he's done a really great job of being emphatic around the meat uh, yeah. you know, and, and cutting off the fat. Well, if you're listening to this show and you're not watching, then you probably didn't see the tears welling up. This is a definitely, it's impressive to see that you guys not only kept a great relationship as father daughter, but um, you know, the mutual admiration of each other just as people uh, within the process. I've worked with family. I am working with family a lot. It's tough. It's uh, that dynamic. Uh, you want to be father daughter first and sometimes because of the dynamic of the situation, the business in that moment has to come first. And that's a really hard thing for a lot of people. So kudos to you guys for not only figuring that out, but keeping a good relationship, the one that uh, is in tears on the Real Producers podcast uh, to shift a little bit so that um, we don't end in tears. I've yeah, got one more. Just know I send them on vacation often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and part of that, it's part of that vacation is sailing. Um, uh, Bob, just real quick, you've got this concept on sailing that I wanted to get to. Um, that is, I think, a, a good way of looking at business and uh the way we as business owners or just people in life should should look at. Um, can you share your thoughts on how sailing relates to the business um before we before yeah, we cap it off? Certainly, Remington. Uh thought about it long and hard, especially when I was sailing one time. If sailor know anybody in sales boats knows that you can't control the wind and the wind in our business analogy is the market, the conditions, maybe people and businesses and vendors and suppliers around you or your clients. There are things you don't control, but the one thing you can control on your boat, a sailboat was your rudder and your sails. And if you know how to adjust those and are willing to adjust those, even though it may take you off course for a while, but it doesn't make the wind throw you into the rocks or to a ground. You're still alive. You're still boat sailing forward. It may take you a little longer to get to where you want to go. It may not be a straight line, but you survive. 
you progress and you arrive. And I think a lot of people forget that. They say, oh, the interest rates went up. Oh, the market's so bad. Or we're political situations. It's, yes, all those things are happening. And the wind's going to shift and swell and gust. And you're on a boat. That's your business. And your only adjustment is your sails and your rudder. And you better figure that out. In fact, Gary Keller wrote a book back in 2007 when the market really crashed called Shift. And he taught all the people in the company, those of which one to listen, how to shift their business, basically moving their sales to the new wind that was coming from behind us when it used to come before us. And it was just, it hit me that what he was doing in the real estate business was what we do in life and on a sailboat when things don't go exactly as it did or as you'd like to. You still have to get to a shore, a safe spot, or arrive. And those who go aground or get sunk or overturned are the ones that sort of hang on to what they know, but what they know doesn't apply anymore to what's happening. And I I focus on what Amazon says, what I focus on, getting my leaders to understand the shifts, the nuances, and the survival techniques. And then hopefully... Mm -hmm. When the wind shifts back again, they're way out in front of all the other boats, some of which you haven't made it at all. And that's phenomenal my advice. I love that advice. And that's where, where I want to finish off the podcast is you took over Keller Williams. You, you helped expand in a time where Keller Williams was coming into the market as a disruptor. It was one that was doing business differently. It was uh, challenging the industry, is improving the industry. And now you're handing over your business to your daughter who's taking over in a time where there's disruptors on top of Keller Williams, right? right. If, you, if you look at eXp, OfferPad, uh, Opendoor, all these other things that are coming into play with what's going on with Zillow, how do you prepare, and Anna, I'll give you a chance to answer this as well. How do you prepare Anna to take over this role in, in a place where there's more disruptors attacking uh, attacking your business? Well, first of all, you have to believe in your value proposition. You have to believe in your platform. You have to deliver in reality what's on the brochure. Culture, whatever you want to call it. A lot of our competitors have some fancy things. They don't have some of our what I call down in the basement, trunks of values. Not to knock them because they're all good companies and they're good people in many ways, uh, including some of the ones we overtook are still good people, good companies. So it's not necessarily the fact that it's your economic model against my economic model or my technology against your technology. It's can you stay to your word? Can you stay with your values? Can you keep your culture? Can you deliver the tools? Can you be a fresh, uh, how do I put this, needed but pointed platform for the people that you serve? They're your customers. They're your partners, however you want to put it. They have the needs. And it's those needs, which is part of that wind shift, that Anna's going to have to take over. And thank God she's got the agent mentality and the experience because that will plus this region inside the Keller Williams models and logos to bring more value to the agents in the Southeast region. I couldn't be more excited. And any follow-up thoughts on that as you're taking over during this time? <laughs> I literally wrote down value and culture were the two things. And of course, Bob, we're cut from the same cloth. So he, he ran with that. But I do feel like, and I understand there's, every market has a series of disruptors. You know, there's lawsuits, there's, um, you know, there's virtual brokerages, there's iBuyers, there's all these things. But the one thing that's going to be constant is that people want to feel seen and they want to have an experience that delivers certainty. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of AI. I love that there's easier ways to, we, it allows the real estate agent to do more business. We can serve more people, but people are never going to want to be out of the flow of having an, a human based experience. Um, so the real estate agent needs to be able to articulate their value proposition and use all these systems and tools to be a lever to provide a better experience. The best book ever read on this subject is the good book called Good to Great. It's Tim Collins. It separates the ones that are going to be here for 20 years 
from the companies that are going to be here for 200 years, the Fords, the GMs, the GEs, they survive in every wind because they know their values, they know their structure, they know their model, and they know how to adjust their sales. Bob and Anna, I appreciate you being on the show. You can grab some tissues as soon as we're done here. Uh, just uh, heartwarming yet uh, inspiring uh, stories of success in both of you. If you are listening to this podcast and you're thinking to yourself, there's not a real producers in my city, you could be the person that brings it to that city. Reach out at realproducersmag.com. And on the subject of the podcast, we just created a new email address called podcast at realproducersmag.com. Give us your notes. Give us your recommendations and your nominations for the show. We'll see you next time.